to Alexander. Can, can you just yes. um, help me yes, real quick? Alexander Tsigas? Am I saying it okay? Okay. Alexander Tsigas is a retired professor at Democritus University in Thrace, uh, Greece. His research concentrates on cybernetics and performativity, especially on the intelligence of natural, artificial, economic systems. His current research focuses on the philosophy of artificial intelligence and architecture using George Spencer Brown's Laws of Form. Alexander, go ahead. Thank you, Randy. Uh, thank you all, first of all. Uh, please look at this uh, presentation as uh, an ongoing research started uh, long ago with a recent PhD in, uh, in architecture. I'm not an architect, but I have a PhD in architecture. That's maybe a little bit contradictory, but I, I plan to study re uh, architecture as well. So that's my next project, if you like. So I, what, what I want to say is that actually the, the, the conference so far brought me new insights, which I tried to incorporate during this uh, few days. So and then I'm, I uh, would like to share it with you. So I, I added um, in, in red uh, the word complexity to discuss about the in-between as potentiality of complexity in architecture. And underneath that I have put where Christopher Alexander, which you probably know, was British, meets uh, John Spencer Brown. And I would add a little bit down there uh, through Martin Heide, and I wish to show you how that connects. To that. So very few milestones from my, from my side. I have a BS in physics. Uh, I have two PhDs, one in uh, back in the 1970s, 80s, multivariable control engineering in Manchester. Um, later dealing with cybernetics, which was uh, then uh, a very, very popular thing, at least uh, cybernetics uh, first and second order. And then in, two th uh, in 2021, in November, I, I got this uh, PhD in, uh, in theory of architecture. And my objective is to uh, do, as I said, to study architecture. Now, um, if we take a look at the, uh, how, how the technology has moved uh, so, the, so, the society, the society has moved technology, you know, it's, which way you take it, it's the same thing. Uh, you will find out that uh, um, that changes. Uh, when we're talking about architecture, of course, there's modernism, there's uh, before it was the classics. Uh, now, some people talk about postmodernism or metamodernism. Some people, some other people say no, modernism continues, et cetera, et cetera. But it's always about the built environment. Um, now, Hal Bracken has written back in 19, it's about 20, 25 years ago, 1998, that our subject is not architecture, but built environment. And you, we observe that all, uh, what always has been with us, not to discover, much less to invent, but to recognize. To recognize that the meaning of space has changed over time, as also uh, Stefan Wolfram told us yesterday, not only in architecture. Now, from an empty something to the acquisition of purposeful structure. But how do we care about it? This is a task, of course, not only for architects, but it's heavily impacted by them. Um, um, so what is architecture? I borrowed uh, what Nikos Salingaros, who was one of the very, very closest collaborators uh, to, to Alexander, to Christopher Alexander in 1999. He's a mathematician, actually. He's not an architect as well. Um, it's not a strict definition about architecture. He claimed that he, he writes in one of his papers, architecture is an extension of the human mind to the environment. We build structures that we may connect to them. This extends our consciousness to our immediate surroundings. And I think we all agree that architecture is that, maybe something else, but at least it's, it is that one. Now this, uh, what, what uh, Nico, Sal Nico Salinger said, uh, he didn't of course mention it, I just interpreted that this already implies a dialectic in between the human being and architectural space. Um, and I claim that in my actually PhD thesis, I come after a long, 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 long time uh, thinking and working that this in between is a 
actually a flip-flop, I will borrow what Andre Oxas uh, said yesterday, like a flip-flop between uh, here and there in, uh, in George Percy Brown uh, notation, uh, close of form notation. So it's a here and there, but the here becomes there and there here, and it's a continuous uh, uh, process. So rephrasing by you and his uh, materialistic dialectic, uh, I claim that there is only here and there with the exception of the in-between. Now, he Heidegger, this is where I, I bring some new stuff now in, in this, uh, what I wanted originally to show. Uh, I'm very much uh, uh, in Heidegger's philosophy. I studied by myself at least 10 years now during my PhD thesis. And I find, and I actually write in my PhD thesis that the GSP, the loss of form notation uh, can be used to explain, actually to represent uh, Heidegger's uh, uh, existential analytics or uh, um, uh, 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 radical ontologies, he called it his, his own way of uh, talking about phenomenology. It is a profound critique of traditional ontology and epistemology, and is setting the scene for the first distinction is in uh, George Percy Brown terms. So I'll, I'll try to, to show to you what might be a first distinction in the um, uh, existential analytics of, uh, of uh, Heidegger. Now, Heidegger writes in Being in Time that the fundamental mode of human existence, which he, called, he calls Dasein, has the characteristic of being in the world. Now, what is this being in the world? Is not a being in, in some world, but being is, of course, uh, the ING form of the verb to be. The world cannot be understood without human existence, and conversely, we're always part of our own considerations. We are part of the world we shape. Now, we know that. Yes, uh, quantum me mechanics says that. Uh, also, second order cybernetics is what, what actually we know. It's, uh, uh, it's actually uh, maybe. Heidegger is, is actually confirming what, what's going on here. Now, I, I, I don't want to maybe bother you with that, but I would just want to show you uh, 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 my thought that a, a possible source for the word Dasein in the German language borrowed by Heidegger, uh, because in German, Dasein means ich bin da, I'm, I am here or I'm there. It's, it's, it's here and there. It's like a, like a flip-flop, as we said yesterday. And there is a word, a, a, Greek, a Greek word, yeah, which is uh, an Homeric, uh, from the Homeric uh, Homer uh, uh, time, which, which says, Raine. Raine means to learn, means to take into the mind, but into the mind as a whole, including in its action, feeling, and connection. To let escape, tends to recall or to turn one's mind to something. So the meaning is not merely that the emotion or activity is perceived or lost as an object of thought but that it is recovered in itself, felt and, and perhaps visibly expressed, or that the consciousness thereof, the emotion, the tendency to action, sees together. Now, I brought this uh, extract from uh, uh, R.B. Ornian, she's uh, um, actually an Irish uh, Hellenist, uh, in his book, from his book, The Origins of European Thought. Now, Heidegger talks about uh, two modes of being for understanding the meaning in, of the in-between. This is what I, I, I use to explain the meaning of the in-between. He talks about present at hand. It's something, it's an object, it's present at hand. It, he calls it for hand in, in, in German. It's a mere object. It's, it's just a theoretical object. It's an object we, we uh, like we scientists uh, or scientists in general like to have in front of them in order to study. So it's opposite to us. Um, and the second mode of uh, being is the ready to hand or two handing something which call is something to, we care about. It's not this, a mere object. This is the purpose of this object, which is not a mere object, not a, 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 an object we theorize about. So if I translate what, or, or change or, or substitute the here and there uh, with, uh, with these modes of, uh, uh, of being uh, in, in, in between, uh, this is what we get. Yes, this is um, President Hunt and ready to hunt. Now, indicating forehanding implies two-handing. Once we indicate uh, the, this one here, we actually imply the other one. If, if they are th is in this, in this side, in the mark side of the, of the 
of the total equation, then of course uh, it implies the other side, which is the uh, present present at hand. Um, now Heidegger identified true handen or ready to hand as a mode of being that contrasts with for handen present at hand. He argues that entities become accessible when we concern ourselves with them in some way. That is when we care about them. This is in Being in Time in, uh, in paragraph 96. To care, which is Zorge in German, uh, to care for entities is to become interested in them in some way so that the entity is no longer a mere object at a distance from us, as something observed and analyzed as described in the 400 mode of being, but rather to come into some interested relation to the entity. Now, in between 400 and 200, let's say uh, in architecting, uh, how we, we see that? How, what is in between 400 and 200 in architecting? So if we connect uh, the experience or the, the, the activity of an architect, the architect looks, uh, looks at entities, alternating as a kind of flip-flop between these two modes. It's actually thinking about materials and stuff like this, things which have to do with engineering, uh, engineering analysis. And of course, at the same time, he or she thinks about an entity that she cares about its purpose within a space structure meaningful for a human being. This is a human connectivity, for example, something that the engineer, a strict engineer, even if it's architectural engineering, it does not really think much about it, or at least it's not it's, uh, his or her uh, goal. Now, being in the world and, and uh, laws of form, it's a word made of distinctions. I claim that being in the world, this is not Heidegger that said that, maybe some other people have said it, but I don't know. At least I claim that. This is my take, if you like. It's a being in the world and LOF, it's a word made of distinctions. Now, if we look at the main theme of uh, John Spencer Brown, Junction, this is how he starts the book, to so, so know, draw a distinction. Uh, on the other hand, what uh, mean, at least as far as I'm concerned from the, from the side of uh, Heidegger, if I use his existential analytics, is let something cap to its aletheia, to its disclosure. Aletheia is again a Greek word which uh, uh, means truth, disclosure, uh, but aletheia means it's, it's a and lithi, it is a, 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 something which comes out of forgetfulness, lithi, yeah, forget. So the mark may be an indication in contrast to what, uh, to that which is yet hidden, yeah, it's in contrast to what is yet hidden. Now we see, of course, that the, uh, the mark and the indication, this, this distinction here, it cannot be arbitrary. It has to be in contrast to something. No, the law of calling, um, in, in this quick way of thinking about it in, in a few hours, I, I just changed this a little bit, uh, my presentation. I think of once disclosed, once an entity is disclosed, cannot be disclosed again. Yeah. Now, and the, law of, and the law of crossing is definitely being towards death. This is a term from, from Heidegger, and I'm not going to go now into detail on that, but this is what I think. Now, this is what, what is my take? My take is that design in architecture or architectural design is identical in the form to the design of a story. So here I would like to make a connection to Leon Conrad's uh, contribution, uh, this very fantastic book, uh, which I had the pleasure to comment on it, that Leon Conrad uncovers the structure stories, places and spaces in architecture hide also structures seeking to be uncovered. This may lead to disclose hidden patterns. And here, there is a connection to uh, Alexander Magdi, a connection to Alexander, Christopher Alexander, uh, uh, language of patterns, or pattern language, as he calls it. Now, the in-between, uh, I claim, is my deck, uh, is the condition of possibility that brings the idea of design for organized complexity. Again, this is a term from Alexander, uh, connecting us to the surrounding world. So again, in between is the condition of possibility. This is, uh, we have to have it, in other words. Now, I look at in the in between um, as uh, five uh, uh, possibilities, uh, ways of looking at it. So I look at in between as experience, in between as communication, 
in between as a, as a system in the uh, Nicholas uh, Luhmann uh, idea, way of thinking, in between as information and in between as a whole. I'll go very quickly through an example that uh, Christopher Alexander is presenting in one of his uh, seminal papers, maybe the first one, uh, which he talks about a city is not a tree. And he actually is not, doesn't mean that it's not, it's not a tree, like, a, like a, a, a tree which has leaves, but he talks about complexity uh, in the way that, and he gives this example. Uh, I'll go through that uh, quickly to, to concentrate on the main, main issues of that. So let's say we have six, six points, which are completely, let's say, not connected to each other. So the complexity is very low, obviously, here. Uh, but if we try to connect them, if we start connecting them, uh, then the complexity will rise. So we look at these uh, points as sets. It could be elements of a set. And here we may have configurations of these elements called sets, of course. Then he gives this, uh, this example. He said, on the right-hand side, you have uh, from what you see from the right hand side, you have a tree configuration, which is obviously a nested configuration, as we call it. And on the left hand side, he said, okay, this is uh, another way of, uh, of looking at complexity in a, in a city. This is what, what, uh, what I pick uh, to be my main things, which tell something to me, it's meaningful, so I can uh, uh, study them further. So he, he, he creates actually. Uh, this diagram on the left hand side, which obviously, at least visually, is uh, more complex than the tree, the pure tree uh, configuration. And he says that the city is a semi lattice. And a semi lattice, as you all know, you are mathematicians, uh, it, it's a very well known theory of lattices. And, and again, he, Alexander, he, he doesn't really go into the mathematics of that, although he, was al al he has also studied mathematics. Um, and you see the complete difference between the three where you have low complexity, oops, you have the low complexity on the right hand side and the city, the high complexity on the left hand side, you can see that there are uh, different ways of connecting stuff, which of course, uh, it depends upon the architect, what he wants or she wants to, to study. I just want if to I, a five minute, five minute warning. Five okay. minutes, okay. Yeah, five more minutes now, Q and A. All right, yes, no, I'll finish in five minutes, okay. Now, I try to generalize this, uh, this way of thinking, and I, uh, uh, all, I have studied a little bit uh, lattice theory in uh, one of my books uh, recently. Uh, so this is how it looks like. You have joint semi-lattice on this side, and you have mid semi lattice on the other hand, on the other side. And uh, uh, if you, this is what actually, what uh, Alexander uh, tried to, to explain that there is an in-between, there is a potentiality of complexity. So I, I, I will try in my research to connect in between uh, to lattice theory, to have patterns, uh, or at least to study real uh, thing, uh, uh, real everyday situations when we plan cities or we plan houses or we think about planning or maybe distracting or constructing something uh, to at least have a scientific way of uh, thinking or scientific way of approaching because architects today, mainstream at least, don't look at architecture as being also part of science. Um, and Alexander says, we are concerned with the difference between structures in which no overlap occurs and those structures in which overlap does occur because this is real life. We have overlaps uh, and no uh, three configurations. Now, this is uh, uh, a way to uh, uh, mathematical uh, approach to, to, uh, to, to discuss about the gathering set. This is the joint operation. This is the common uh, meet operation, which you all know. The elements of architectural units. So X and Y are not just symbols. They are elements of architectural units in the way I explained before. So the gathering set is that. And the common set meet operation is that. And trees and semi, are, and semi letters are similar in the form, but mutually ex exclusive. Of course, a tree is a semi lattice, but it's a tri trivial one. So if I take the semi lattice, then I exclude the tree. If I take the tree, I exclude the semi lattice. And here again are the five different ways of looking at, uh, at the in between. The in between is here and there, it's a flip flop between here and there. Uh, and this is where I actually use. Uh, the, the, uh, the idea of uh, Leon that I say we may approach the design uh, of, um, 
uh, of uh, the design in, arch in architecture, uh, trying to use uh, the symbols of uh, of, uh, of uh, George Spencer Brown laws of form, uh, talking about the functions and in the architecture, what it really means, every symbol, what is the function of it, and what uh, what uh, addresses actually on the other hand, the, on the other side, the architectural unit. So pointings, for example, the mark where, what, where, and when, like uh, Leon says, and I say, okay, what, what we're talking about here is not is not a story, but it's an architectural story, and and so on. And here uh, I try to make a connection between the in, be, in between and here and there. So I have the uh, uh, different different operations of in, in between uh, here and there, the different status or modi of uh, here and there, and then the structure, here, which I need, of course, to uh, to research further. Now, how to read this one? After we all heard about that, this is a quite known building in London. And Church uh, Street in London. And on the other hand, we have the Upper Research Center in California. The question is do these structures connect to the city? Do they connect to, to the human being? Do they tell a story? Now, and here are my conclusions. I claim that uh, laws of form may help to achieve both uncover and define living structures, as uh, this is living structure. Is, is a term by, used by Christopher Alexander, but unfortunately, I think he couldn't find the way to do it. He actually explained a lot. So he was more or less accused that he's talking about traditionalism, but he, he never talked about traditionalism anyway. So the in-between is potentiality to organize complexity and build connectivity. This is the second one. The third is that as such, the in-between is conditional possibility for complexity in architecture, uh, but there is a lot of research to be done uh, to come to some tangible results for practitioners. And I would like to thank you. This is actually this text deconstructed using uh, the codes that uh, Leon Contran provided me for writing, being able to write uh, the, the mark. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, it's so beautiful that you connect um, in between Leon and the and, and <laughs> later on after the after the lunch break we'll have um, uh, William Bricken who's done a lot with with systems architecture although he's talking about something else today um, we, we have questions I I will turn to them I just wanted to also use as a guide to um, some laws of form and Heidegger uh, conversation um, like you bring up um, this book. Um, <clears throat> the Further Shores of Knowing, a Meta Metaphysical Musical Fantasy uh, by uh, Michael Urheber and, and Jack Ingstrom, who's right here. Um, on page 127, there's some references. Um, Heidegger in a question concerning technology, a late work, you know, talks about framing. Um, <clears throat> and, and so he's, he's really, he's talking about um, cybernetics in here as well, um, the end of philosophy and the task of thinking. Um, he says, no prophecy is necessary to recognize that the sciences now establishing themselves will soon be determined and regulated by the new fundamental science that is called cybernetics. And indeed, um, in The Turning, shortly after that, he, he brings up um, the Holderlin uh, him where, the, where danger is grows the saving power also. Okay, and so his point is that he's like, he's saying like, there's a new way of thinking, he calls it. You know that that is cybernetics. Now he didn't know the Spencer Brownian second order type of cybernetics. This beautiful architecture of the dankest dank economy, right? This beauty of mathematics all manifest right there, unmessified. You know, not messy, right? And um, so there, there's this interesting connection um, that Heidegger has um, both to this architectural stuff that that we're talking about as well. Um, to cybernetics, which is all connected up with laws of form. But then, um, I, this is my, my second little thingy here. Um, going the other way, the Dasein's Lehre that, that Heidegger develops of, of his own, um, you know, builds on so much. Um, the the Zeins Lehre in, in general, ontology this, in the late German idealist tradition um, is also very much expressed in his predecessor in ontological phenomenology, had become a Martius. And there's a lot of um, speculation out there that he kind of, um, kind of burned her like he did Heide, um, Husserl and Edith Stein, especially. 
right? So, so anyway, it's just very interesting to, to look at the connections um, that we, we could potentially have between laws of form and Heidegger with, with, with um, you know, with Conrad Martius in particular, um, but also because Conrad Martius engages cybernetics. She writes about Max Benz, a very early German um, cybernetician whose work you can find out there, like, you know, available. Um, anyway, those are just some, some like immediate connections um, that I have because this is a, definitely a beckoned area for, for development of in between. There's so much, right, in the vexology. Um, but but so, so I just wanted to in, inject that stuff. Um, I, I, do you want to respond to some of those? I, I kind of was talking about different directions, um, you know, the Heidegger cybernetics laws of form kind of connections, as well yeah. deeper like being and Dasein. Uh, yes, actually, I'm uh, for many, many years now ad advocate of uh, interrelating and not having science as a, what the, the word means. Science means cutting. This is actually what science means. If you look at the, the etymology of the word, it comes from science, uh, from cutting, you know. So the way that science uh, works at least for many, many years, if I understand why, because it's uh, kind of, uh, you have to enclose something to sort of try and put it up there, opposite of you and, and study it. Uh, it has to become, um, this is what may, may be the project of Heidegger after death, but he died, uh, died. all right. Yeah. So uh, this is what he wanted to do. He actually, just, he wanted to go and say, look, science is not what you know now. You have to look at more integrative way. I mean, it's not, for example, I'll give you never the example. If you look at Athens, it's really a chaotic city. It's not a beautiful city. But if you look, if you go, maybe you don't know Athens. But let's say you go to Bologna or to, uh, okay, Florence, of course, uh, one of the uh, nice Italian cities, and even London, even London, even with, uh, uh, even, I mean, uh, uh, that Italy, France has this type of, of tradition. These are beautiful cities. What is what makes a city beautiful? Uh, and if you talk to, to, uh, to, to scientists, they will say, oh, okay, I mean, uh, it's not my point. I mean, I'm not going to bother now about the architects who, who built now, I don't know, modern, a modern uh, building which has no connection to people, has no connection to human being. It doesn't have any connection to being in the world. It's like as if uh, somebody says, you know, I'm the, the, the real God and I can decide what is beautiful, what is not beautiful, and I'm not bothering um, because it's modernist and modernist uh, way of thinking. So, but maybe it's a, it's a, it's a critic uh, against, uh, against modernism. Now, what, to, to your point uh, is, of course, uh, I see a very high connection between cybernetics with Heidegger analytics, existential analytics, and using the mathematics of laws of form to describe even, even to calculate, I don't know if I can say that, to calculate, to account for what Heidegger uh, talked about uh, in his radical ontology, because his ontology has nothing to do with entities. And if we're trying, because I heard yesterday or the day before it was, a keynote speaking from, uh, I don't remember now his name, the guy uh, talking about said. Yes, he was talking about ontology. Of course, the traditional way of thinking about ontology will not drive you to, to artificial intelligence. It's impossible. But cybernetical thinking, meta-cybernetical or neo-cybernetics, Heidegger, <laughs> if we believe it or not, I think I'm completely, absolutely sure uh, that this is a way to, 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 uh, to, to understand artificial intelligence. I mean, I mean, we have to go specific, away of this ontology stuff. In, in very traditional specific events, you know, he's he's coming. He's actually that's coming from uh, formal and trans from um, logical investigations of, of Husserl. So, in fact, there is that depth dimension there. But you know, I definitely yeah. see the distinction that you're you're drawing between <coughs> applied ontology. Yeah. You know, it's you it's know applied. the the problem is, uh, and I know in in the Anglo-American, uh, not yeah. time zone, yeah. but let's say where way of thinking, system of thinking. Uh, Heidegger didn't bring, didn't, uh, is not very high. It's Husserl, on the other hand, it's uh, really, for me, not understandable, really, that he has so much success in, in being used and actually abused because 
whatever they tell, they are putting in his mouth that he said, he didn't say. He was a mathematician. He talked about geometry. This is a very nice text from him. We have, maybe we have to reread it, what, what he said about geometry. Um, some stuff, okay. You know, we know that uh, there was a, a, a bit of a problem between uh, Husserl and uh, Heidegger. Uh, and also, we know, I know that because to, of his. We, we gotta, we gotta, um, keep going. Maybe, maybe there's a, is there another, another contribution? Otherwise, we really got, we're getting behind. All right. Oh, uh, yeah, let me see. Where are we at? <clears throat> yeah, Bernie. Oh, yeah, Bernie, do you want to go ahead? Oh, yeah, thanks, Randy. And thanks for the talk. It's very interesting. Uh, as Randy might know, I, I find the connection between Heidegger and uh, and George Spitzerman very difficult. Um, but in teaching philosophy, I always have to come up against Heidegger because so many of the students are interested in him. So I, I guess I, I do need some help. Um, but yeah. I'm, I'm interested. I I I I, ha I have to engage with this critique of Heidegger of uh, ancient Greeks uh, in this term for truth, uh, aletheia, aletheia. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and so it means kind of like unforgetting or disclosure. And um, and and then I went back to Plato and had a look at how he uses. Um, uses that term and really actually he doesn't use it in the way that would make sense with Heidegger it would be more where he's using the words for being or the word, word to be and that truth is just like correspondence as in that a picture depicting its a subject is in correspondence to it so and then I was just wondering the way you referred to it there when you were saying that, um, that you were talking about making a distinction is 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 like a disclosure, um, or you know I'm thinking unforgetting or whatever Alethea. Um, so truth is unforgetting, distinction is disclosure. The presumption you make in disclosure is that it's already there and that you're just bringing it forward. You're unforgetting it, if you like. So I can't see it as the same thing. It's almost a bit like to, to call and to call again. Thank you, Bernie. Um, I, I think, um, Alex, you can, um, Alexander, you can reply to that um, very briefly. We have one more uh, question, comment um, as well before um, we're over time. But um, yeah, did you want to reply to that, Alexander, real quick? And then yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, no, you, you're coming from the Platonist, uh, uh, tradition. And there is a dichotomy here between Platon and Aristotle, which lasts for, I don't know, 3,000 years now. Um, of course, uh, Heidegger comes from the Aristotle, more from Aristotle's side, but, but he overturned it. You know, he started from, uh, actually, he started from him. Started that being, as uh, we can say, you can say it many times, in many different ways. But phenomenology, the word phenomenology means that it, 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 something comes to light. Now, whether it was there, not there, all right, who bothers? Yeah. Could be, yeah. or maybe not. On the other hand, this is something coming, coming to light. This something, Heidegger never used the word something or thing. So whatever comes to light, it could be a new creation or it could be something which of course was there and where it is only disclosed. Uh, disclosed yeah. in, in, in the English term, in the, like, say we, you open, uh, a door and something comes out, you know, or you open something, a hole in the in the <coughs> earth, and something comes up, pops up like oh, yeah. the uh, plant. Alexander. So, yes. but we can, uh, I can help you, of course, to talk to, yeah. to understand a little bit more Alithia in the Greek sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, Which is not yeah. truth. It's uh, Alithia. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. So, uh, Randy, you took up a bit of time. So, um, I'm just wondering if I can push, push it, push it here oh, a little bit. Okay. Um, no, it's just because the Greek words are very interesting here, and I think the ones that are really profound for me is the word wording around limit, right? So, peri or peras and aperon, and I mean these appear in the pre-Socratics in the first you know, an Aximander, the first fragment we have. And then in, in the first Pythagorean uh, text from Philolaus, we've got, um, we've got um, uh, the, the, you know, the world comes into being from unlimited or, you know, indistinct to limit and through limiting. And then you look at the actual Greek word for experience, imperia, impera, you know, where we get empiricism yeah. from, that means um, 
to, if you like, M limit, to, to limit. So actually experiencing something is to make a limit of it, to make it limited, to make it distinct. So I, I think it is really good to engage with, with these Greek words in our tradition, but I'm not always sure that we're doing it in the right way with Heidegger. I'll have, I'm, I will be happy to, uh, to discuss with you further and of, online and offline, of course, and through exchanging written things. I'm very happy about that. But actually, I'm, I'm more or less, uh, I would say, thank again to you all that you brought me some new insight, which I could, at least at the last, last minute, just put them there and share with them. I just didn't, I have not thought very, very profoundly about that, but I feel that something there. I'm this, so is, happy this, this is one final thing that I want to say. I started uh, engaging with uh, Heidegger, which is a very practical philosopher. He's not a philosopher of, of uh, uh, thinking about God. Of course, he talked about God, but uh, he was actually, uh, he studied theology at the beginning and then he left. Uh, before finishing, um, I started engaging with, with uh, Heidegger because uh, as a physicist, somebody who came from physics, from, from the positive side of science, I said, there must be something else. You cannot restrict everything there. You know, it's just something must be there, something else. So that's why I started. I, I, I found in Heidegger, uh, right. when oh. I started reading, that I said, maybe there is something there. Yeah. Thank this, you very this much. Very, this is very good and very exciting. And and Bernie, that's actually what I wanted to talk about. So thank you, Bernie, uh, about the Peros and a Pyron and everything. Um, so we've, we've come to the limit here. Uh, give a round of applause.